I want to thank everyone coming today to our first Tuesday. This is the first, first Tuesday in our new location at the main library. I appreciate everyone being here. Um, I apologize for our screen. It didn't dawn on me until Tracy and Gordon got here. I didn't have a screen. And so uh, there's, we're still trying to figure a few things out in our move. So uh, ne next time we'll have a bed sheet up here. So we're, we're class all the way, you know. Um, but anyway, I appreciate you being here today uh, and being part of our first Tuesday programs. Um, today we have uh, Tracy and Gordon Belt. And uh, to start off, uh, Gordon Belt is an archives, archives advocate, public historian, and founding editor of the Posterity Project, an award-winning blog devoted to archives and history in Tennessee. Gordon holds a master's degree in history from Middle Tennessee State University and a bachelor's in political science from Chattanooga. He's director of public services for the Tennessee State Library and Archives and previously worked as a library manager for the First Amendment Center. And Tracy Nichols Belt, is the author of Onward Southern Soldiers, Religion in the Army of Tennessee in the Civil War. She's an ordained and licensed minister and holds a master's degree in history from Middle Tennessee State University and a bachelor's degree in political science from Anderson University. <clears throat> she has appeared on radio and television to talk about the role of religion in the Civil War, including the 2012 Nashville Public Television documentary, Crisis of Faith, part of the Nashville Public Television's Tennessee Civil War 150 series. Um, today, uh, Gordon and Tracy are gonna talk about John Sevier, their new book, John Sevier, Tennessee's First Hero. And uh, I appreciate them being here today. Their books will be back there later on for signing. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Gordon. Thank you very much, Ken. It's, it's a real honor to be here today to talk to you about John Sevier, Tennessee's first hero. And uh, I want to dig in a little bit about the book um, and touch upon the broad themes expressed in this book, the themes of history, myth, and memory on the Tennessee frontier. First, uh, Ken gave a little bit of a background about us. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Tracy's the primary author of our first book, Onward Southern Soldiers, Religion in the Army of Tennessee in the Civil War. And that book looked at the role that religion played as motivation in the lives of the soldiers who served in the Army of Tennessee CSA in fighting the Civil War. And the Civil War actually played a significant role in how Tennesseans remember John Sevier's life. And so this is something that Tracy will discuss a little bit later in our presentation. I'm the primary author of Onward Southern Soldiers, or I'm sorry, the John Sevier. And so this is a book that's a result of about three years of writing and research on my part and a lifetime of interest in Tennessee history. And so John Sevier's story is, is something that I found compelling and something that I felt deserved some attention. Um, our book examines Sevier's life in three phases, pioneer, soldier and statesman. You see the monument here at the old Knox County Courthouse. Those words are inscribed in stone on that monument and those words committed to posterity, the life and accomplishments of Tennessee's first hero, John Sevier. This book is part historiography and part biography. And so we looked to these words as inspiration to examine Sevier's life and legacy through this lens of history and memory. And so this epitaph that you see here, it describes Sevier as a pioneering founding father of the state of Tennessee, a heroic revolutionary war soldier, and Tennessee's first elder statesman. And the stories told of Sevier's life by the writers and storytellers and historians of the late 19th and early 20th centuries tell us about much as, as much about the men who wrote about his life as they do Severe himself. It was during this period that historians, novelists, folklorists, they were all heavily influenced by the world around them and those, this world influenced how they depicted John Severe's life. Early in our country's history, as a new nation, America needed its patriotic heroes to forge a national character and identity. And John Sevier fit perfectly within this role as a patriotic hero of the American frontier. And years later, in the years surrounding the Civil War, 
as writers looked to John Sevier's life for inspiration, as the nation ripped itself apart over the issue of slavery, as the nation fought in a violent civil war and then after the civil war during reconstruction as it sought healing and unity, they looked to the heroes of the American Revolution, a war prior to the Civil War, as inspiration to draw the country together. And Tennesseans, they, Sevier's life and accomplishments during this war provided Tennesseans with a tangible link to that victory and the ideals of liberty and freedom expressed during this earlier time. And so divine providence is also something that influenced these writers and is in manifest destiny as well. And, and Severe was a man who was at the forefront of this westward push toward putting civilization in the frontier. So our goal in writing this book was to present a fresh look at John Severe's life through this historiographical lens. The writers of this time period, the late 19th and early 20th century, they depicted John Sevier as a bit of a demigod, and they described Sevier in glowing, almost reverential terms. Um, this brings to mind one great leader of our country, the father of our country, George Washington, to whom he's often compared. In one account, Sevier is described as, quote, the handsomest man in the state with a noble bearing endowed by nature with those rare qualities which made the possessor in all places and with all people an object of attention and a depository of their confidence. The writer and novelist James Gilmore called John Severe the idol of the frontier people, and he singled out Severe as a man of boundless courage, constant fortitude, and self-devoted patriotism worthy of the most heroic of ages. John Severe's son, named Colonel George Washington Severe, no less, said his father had died as he had lived, a firm and true friend of his country, and that his father was his namesake, George Washington's disciples. Early Tennessee historians and antiquarians like John Haywood, J.G.M. Ramsey, and Lyman Draper and others, they chose to focus on Severe's heroic qualities as a way to build up a man who could represent Tennessee as its very own founding father. And John Sevier was for them the George Washington of the Old Southwest. And much like Parson Weems embellished Washington's life with stories of questionable accuracy, you may remember hearing stories about Washington chopping down the cherry tree and that he could tell no lie. Similar stories about John Sevier's exploits also were written by these writers and these stories were often embellished. Now that's not to say that John Sevier was not a charismatic leader or he wasn't a popular leader. He most certainly was, but he was a human being with flaws, ambitions, and human frailties that were not necessarily evident in these early narratives. So let's look at John Sevier's life first as a pioneer through this lens of history and memory. Writers heralded Sevier's arrival to the Watauga Valley on Christmas Day, 1773, as a seminal moment in Tennessee history. And Sevier's inclusion in the list of commissioners on the Watauga Association placed him in a leadership role in the region and provided inspiration for writers and storytellers who envisioned Severe as one of the first statesmen of the early republic. J.G.M. Ramsey declared that Severe and the settlers who established the Watauga Association outlined in advance the nation's work and established the first free and independent community on the continent. And another writer called the Watauga Association one of the most thoroughly democratic instruments ever penned in the New World. These 19th century writers and storytellers saw Watauga as an early experiment in democracy on the frontier, and Severe was its standard bearer. Now, one folk tale in particular that helped place Severe in a higher plateau than his fellow Watagans was a legend that took place in Watauga, where Severe witnessed a violent encounter during a horse race following a successful land lease negotiation with the Cherokee Indians. A frontier bully named Shote took a horse from another man in a bet. And he claimed to have won it, 
although the owner insisted he had made no bet. Now, following a heated argument witnessed by Severe, a violent altercation occurred. And in the aftermath, one Cherokee lay dead and another, and the rest of the tribe left in disgust and vowed revenge for what had happened. And so this violent encounter witnessed by Severe between the Watagans and this horse thief provided Severe with the motivation he needed to establish the rule of law on the frontier. Writers and storytellers embellished this story with literary flourishes. And in one example, during the Tennessee Centennial Exposition, it was noted that, quote, the infant community on the Watauga existed without law, but nevertheless existed in profound peace and perfect security. It went on to add, quote, but as Satan entered the Eden in the form of a serpent, so he entered this little utopia in the wilderness in the guise of a horse thief who at once kindly awakened the settlers to the necessity of organized government. Now another folk tale originating in the Watauga Valley helped create this lasting image of Severe as a brave frontier gentleman. Severe's second wife, Catherine Sherrill, otherwise popularly known as Bonnie Kate, was Severe's first lady in the hearts and minds of most Tennesseans. And the story of how these two soulmates met really symbolized the heroic frontier spirit that were espoused in these early narratives of Tennessee history. Now, Severe's howling rescue of young Bonnie Kate uh, at Fort Caswell on the morning of July 21st, 1776, echoed through the pages of history in fantastic accounts based on oral traditions passed down through generations of family members and storytellers. And according to legend, Bonnie Kate was outside the fort milking a cow when a band of Cherokees attacked the fort. And as Severe was securing the fort, Bonnie Kate found herself trapped outside the walls. And so she found herself suddenly in imminent danger. So as the Cherokees pursued Bonnie Kate, the legend had it, she ran towards the stockade, leaped up to grab the top of the stockade, to pull herself over and into the arms of our hero, John Severe. <laughs> Other accounts have John Severe actually reaching over the fort walls, gunning down her Cherokee pursuers and lifting her up over the walls to safety. And so while the details of this account vary and are embellished in the pages of history, the stories of this chance encounter and gallant rescue helped build John Severe's life and legend as a bit of a romantic, a hero, and a leader of men on the frontier. Now, historical accounts of John Severe's relations with the Cherokee Indians in particular also placed him in this heroic light. Severe's chroniclers said of him that the Indians had a great reverence of him, yet a great dread of his mode of warfare. And so John Severe, in his mode of warfare, usually employed a small but well-trained army of frontiersmen. And they used this army to penetrate the contested Native American territory. They destroyed villages, they captured and killed adversaries, and in a lot of cases, these skirmishes became bloody confrontations of hand-to-hand -hand combat between the white settlers who sought to defend their newly acquired territory and the Native Americans who saw the white man's ever increasing encroachment on their land as a threat. And so in all, Severe engaged in no less than 35 battles with Native Americans, some of them hardly contested or decisive, but all of which, legend has it, Severe emerged victorious. And the efforts by these writers and historians to put Severe's battles with these Native Americans into broader context, this really began in earnest in the aftermath of the Civil War, at a time when the nation sought healing from the wounds of that great war. In a biographical sketch of Severe written in 1893, Oliver Perry Temple went so far as to equate Severe's skirmishes with the Native Americans and the Creek Indians with battles fought by the patriots of the American Revolution. In his sketch, Temple wrote, quote, 
The far-reaching importance of this Indian fighting has not been and is not now half appreciated. Few men ever think that when Sevier and Robertson, Boone and Logan were repelling Indian attacks or invading Indian country, they were doing anything more than protecting the white settlements, whereas in fact they were unconsciously fighting the battles of the American Revolution. Now early Tennessee historians and writers they heap praise on John Sevier for his fighting prowess against the Cherokees. And one writer in particular found in Sevier a kindred spirit. In 1889, Theodore Roosevelt, our nation's 26th president, authored a book called The Winning of the West. And this was a book that was part narrative history and part tribute to Manifest Destiny. And while researching his book, he made frequent trips to Nashville. And he wrote to Judge John M. Lee, president of the Tennessee Historical Society. And in a letter, he proclaimed, quote, I like pioneer life, and the part of our history for which I most care is that dealing with the expansion of our frontier and the building up of our nation. Severe, Shelby, Clark, Boone, Crockett, Houston are all figures that excite my interest and sympathy far more than do the Eastern leaders of the same time. Now, Roosevelt, however, did not shy away from writing critically about Sevier and his exploits on the frontier. In his book, he documented an incident that occurred in 1788, where in the aftermath of one particular battle, several Cherokee chiefs were taken prisoner. And among the soldiers assigned to guard uh, was the prisoners was a man named John Kirk. And Kirk's family had been slaughtered in a previous skirmish with the Cherokee Indians. And so as you can imagine, he was eager to take vengeance into his own hands. And so according to Roosevelt's account of the incident, Severe put the Cherokee ch chiefs in a hut, and he later, le later left the scene, all the while knowing that Kirk and his compatriots were eager to take justice into their own hands. And so as the story is told, Kirk entered the hut where the Cherokees were confined and he attacked them with a tomahawk and his comrades looked on without interfering. Roosevelt called this incident quote a horrible deed of infamy and he said it was criminal negligence on Severe's part to leave his prisoners to the mercy of the bloodlust of his followers. Most writers however believe that Severe was actually shocked and horrified to learn of Kirk's actions and they also believed that Severe was justified in his brutal mode of warfare against the Cherokee population. One writer named James Phelan wrote in his book, History of Tennessee, quote, if his mode of warfare was barbarous, he was waging a war against barbarians, brave, cruel, relentless, and treacherous, without any of the things which civilization gave, except its engines of destruction. He went on to say, quote, Severe was not a man to trifle with his task. Indian incursions could only be stopped by exterminating the Indians, hence he tried to exterminate them. This brings us into a discussion about John Sevier, the soldier. And he was a soldier, a hero of the American Revolution. One battle in particular helped forge his reputation as the man most responsible for turning the tide of the American Revolution in the Southern theater to the Patriots' favor in arguably what was the most decisive battle of the Southern campaign of the American Revolutionary War. The Battle of Kings Mountain pitted a frontier militia led by Severe and other Patriot leaders against loyalists to the British Crown led by British Major Patrick Ferguson. In a little more than one hour, employing tactics that Severe had used against the Cherokee Indians, he totally decimated uh, Ferguson's American Tories with every last man either left dead or taken prisoner. And Thomas Jefferson later hailed this victory as, quote, a memorable victory that turned the tide of success and terminated the revolution with a seal of independence. And of all his heroic exploits chronicled for posterity, the Battle of Kings Mountain was literally John Sevier's finest hour. The Battle of Kings Mountain was a distinctively regional conflict embraced by regional and particularly southern writers and historical scholars. Sevier's participation in this battle not only helped launch his political career and ambitions, 
It casts him as a legend and a hero, spawning numerous folk tales, stories, songs, and poetry inspired by this great victory. And it bolstered Severe's reputation as a leader and central figure in the battle. And though the battle actually took place along the border between North and South Carolina, Severe gathered his men at, at the uh, Sycamore Shoals prior to the battle on land would eventually become part of East Tennessee. And so this gave Tennesseans a role in the outcome of the American Revolution. In the years following the battle, veterans and their descendants sought remembrance for Severe and his compatriots on this aptly named mountain that once humbled a king. They did this through the construction of monuments and memorials during key anniversaries of the Battle of Kings Mountain. And for Tennesseans, these monuments and ceremonies became a rallying point for remembrance. In the years surrounding the Civil War, those years heavily influenced how Tennesseans chose to remember this battle. And to discuss this aspect of the book, I want to bring my wife Tracy up to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm going to speak for just a few moments about one aspect of the remembrance of the Battle of Kings Mountain. The Battle of Kings Mountain represented a uniquely Southern contribution to the winning of the American Revolution and to the founding of the United States. It spoke of a time when our nation's patriots rallied together behind a common cause. And this became very important in the decades leading up to the Civil War when the nation became bitterly divided. So on that mountaintop, so long forgotten, years after the battle, on October 7th, 1855, nearly 55,000 people gathered in the Carolina wilderness to remember William Campbell, Isaac Shelby, John Sevier, and their army of overmountain men. The venerated historian and statesman George Bancroft held the attention of those assembled for two hours and in a very eloquent address, he spoke not only to the events that actually occurred at the Battle of Kings Mountain, but he also spoke to the concerns of the day. The North and South were bitterly divided, and yet they sought unity ever so briefly on this mountain. And in his speech, Bancroft really played to the emotions of the Southern in his audience. He acknowledged the South and its important role in the outcome of the Revolutionary War, but he also used this moment to proclaim the Battle of Kings Mountain as a unifying force. Bancroft aimed his words to strike at the heart of Southerners as he wanted to evoke both a spirit of patriotism, but also give a call for national unity. And I wanted to read you a few of his words. Bancroft declared, there is still stronger reason why the North should give you its sympathy on this occasion. She sent you no aid in the hour of your greatest need. It is a blessed thing to give even a cup of cold water in a right spirit. It was not then possible to do even that. All honor must be awarded to the South since she was left to herself alone in the hour of her utmost distress. The romance of the American Revolution has its scenes for the most part in the South and the Battle of Kings Mountain, of which we celebrate the 75th anniversary today, was the most romantic of all. He went on to declare, the states are bound together by commerce and dovetailed by canals and rivers and railroads. But the recollections of the crowded hours of this glorious action of our fathers speak to the heart and make us feel more than all the rest that we are one people. But in the years following Bancroft's address, the divided nation declared war upon itself. On April 12, 1861, the firing on Fort Sumter launched the Civil War, and the Civil War nearly erased all of what John Sevier and his compatriots had accomplished at the Battle of Kings Mountain. By the time of the centennial anniversary in 1880 came around, the North had conquered the South, and Reconstruction had left very bitter wounds unhealed. So once again, Political leaders looked to the Battle of Kings Mountain as a nation attempted to bind these wounds so desperately severed and left unhealed. The Kings Mountain Centennial Association drafted a resolution that stated that as a nation, 
We would celebrate the ever memorable period when under a common flag and with a common hope and a common destiny, our forefathers gained one of the glorious victories that gave us liberty. For Tennesseans in particular, Kings Mountain represented a tangible link to the American victory in the Revolutionary War. This state, once so torn apart by civil war, saw its citizens unite again around the accomplishments of their first hero, John Sevier. On January 4th, 1880, Tennessee Governor Albert Marks delivered a joint resolution regarding the upcoming 100th commemoration of the battle to Governor T.J. Jarvis of North Carolina. And in reply, Jarvis expressed his gratitude to Tennessee for their desire to participate in the festivities. And in a letter dated January 26, 1880, Jarvis emphasized that it indeed was Southern men who had provided this, this very pivotal victory in the American Revolution. Jarvis declared the success that befell the American arms on Kings Mountain, a success achieved by Southern troops under Southern leaders upon Southern soil was the turning point in the War of the Revolution. The North Carolina Resolution went on to speak of the great blessings of both civil and religious liberty that had been won during the Revolutionary War. During the 100th anniversary, there were several days of commemoration that took place on the battlefield. And on the final day, as the ceremonies concluded, the audience ended the day by singing praise, uh, songs of hymns and praise. And so as I conclude my remarks before turning the presentation back over to Gordon, I wanted to touch just briefly on this connection of what religion and how religion played in the remembrance of the Battle of Kings Mountain. On October 7th, 1897, Tennessee's Centennial Exposition in Nashville observed Kings Mountain Day. And Tennessee Governor Robert Love Taylor delivered a rousing speech to the 500 men and women who were assembled in the auditorium. And in his speech, Taylor evoked Christian symbolism in his tribute to Severe and the Over Mountain Men. And this was particularly, particularly fitting because just prior to leaving Sycamore Shoals to go fight the battle, Severe and his Over Mountain Men heard a rousing and passionate sermon delivered by the Reverend Samuel Doak. And the Reverend Doak preached about Gideon and his mighty 300. And so the men left to fight the battle with the war cry on their lips of the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And now over a hundred years later, Governor Taylor would remark, I thought how fate had named its King's Mountain and had placed the King's regulars on its summit who shouted long live the King as they looked down upon the advancing mountaineers climbing up the rugged slopes to crush the hopes of the King and I said, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He led old Moses to the mountaintop to write his law on the tablets of stone. He landed the ark on a mountaintop and Christ preached his grandest sermon on the mount. The ark of his covenant rested there. And it was there that a sermon was preached that tyrants will never forget. Taylor concluded his remarks by thanking God for the Battle of Kings Mountain that made us a nation of free and independent people. The issues leading up to the Civil War and the scars that remained following the war were addressed through the actions of these patriots who fought the Battle of Kings Mountain. So over the years, chroniclers spoke of a unique Southern and religious people that had provided this victory with the optimism that their descendants could yet again Unite a great nation. And I'll turn it back over to Gordon. Thank you, Tracy. Now, in the aftermath of this great battle, Sevier skillfully used his hard earned reputation as a Revolutionary War hero to forge a reputation as a political leader. And he did this to great effect in his effort to establish a state beyond the western mountains of North Carolina. And this is where John Sevier, the statesman, makes himself known to the region. In 1784, the state of Franklin emerged from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains on territory that would eventually become part of East Tennessee. And that land was claimed by the state of North Carolina, but was later ceded to uh, the Congress to pay off its Revolutionary War debt. So the settlers of the region were very eager 
to establish their own government because they believed that the mother state of North Carolina was not attending to their needs as citizens. The land speculators, however, they were opposed to this movement and the Franklinites. And this eventually led to a complex and violent conflict between two factions led by the region's most dynamic leaders. One is our Tennessee's first hero, John Sevier, and another named John Tipton. Now, Sevier's political fortunes in Franklin rose and fell amid the backdrop of this rivalry between him and Tipton. Tipton was a popular judge, a legislator, a political leader, and he originally served as a delegate to the State of Franklin Convention, but he opposed John Sevier in, in the State of Franklin movement. By contrast, although Sevier initially opposed leaving the state of North Carolina, he was talked into joining the Franklinites, and they elected him as their first and only governor. And so in his letters and his rhetoric, you can see Sevier evoking the memory of the, his status as a revolutionary war hero. And he advocated for a separate state of Franklin by calling on those memories of the prior conflict. He recalled how his citizens, quote, saved their state out of the hands of the enemy and saved her from impending ruin. He made the case that North Carolina had abandoned its Western citizens in much the same way that the British had abandoned its colonists during the American Revolution. And this was a memory still fresh on the minds of the over mountain men who served alongside Sevier during the Battle of Kings Mountain. Tipton, on the other hand, he viewed Franklin's secession movement as a treasonous act, and he pledged allegiance to North Carolina in 1785. And so this feud between Tipton and Sevier erupted, and it eventually led to an armed conflict on Tipton's farm between loyalists to Sevier and loyalists to Tipton. Tipton and his men held off Sevier and his charge on the farm just long enough to call from North Carolina for North Carolina reinforcements. And after some time, Sevier eventually surrendered and was arrested on a charge of treason, a charge that was later dropped. Writers and storytellers cast the State of Franklin movement not as a failure, but as a four-year experiment in democracy on the frontier. And they placed John Sevier as its leader who answered charges of treason with heroic resolve Tipton's legacy, on the other hand, suffered. And one writer even compared Tipton to the devil himself. And he later stated that, quote, of John Tipton, all trace of time disappears. Now, eventually, Sevier overcame the, char uh, the stigma associated with Tipton's charge of treason. And his popularity among the people of the early Tennessee frontier only momentarily waned. In 1796, the state of Tennessee earned congressional approval to become the United States 16th state, and the people elected John Sevier as its first governor, which was a testament to his overwhelming political popularity at the time. John Sevier's time as governor of Tennessee, however, was not without conflict. And by this time, a young rival on the scene had emerged. And the name of this rival was Andrew Jackson. This is actually one of my favorite parts of my, the book. Personal rivalry between Sevier and Jackson began in 1796, when Jackson offered himself up as a candidate for Major General of the State Militia. And Governor Sevier, however, he favored another man named George Conway. And so Sevier helped secure Conway's position to that post which left Jackson infuriated. Uh, but Sevier brushed the young upstart politician aside, and he said he claimed very little, he cared very little about the charges of, quote, a poor, pitiful, petty, fogging lawyer. That's what he called Jackson. <laughs> the feud between Sevier and Jackson escalated after Sevier himself was denied the same position in the state militia when Archibald Roan nominated Andrew Jackson to the post. And so Sevier used this defeat as motivation to run for office once more as governor. And he earned that office. And he, during the 
election, however, he was greeted with charges of bribery and scandal. Andrew Jackson had produced documents claiming Sevier had engaged in a massive land fraud, and he asserted that Sevier had conspired to destroy original records of land ownership, and he replaced them with forged claims. And he further alleged that Sevier had resorted to bribery to keep the replacement quiet. And despite these claims, Sevier was actually successful in his campaign for governor. Can't imagine a campaign where you're, you're accused of bribery that you'll succeed, but he did. But he was still chafing under the, the weight and humiliation of Jackson's accusations. And so when these two men met on the courthouse steps in Knoxville, Tennessee on October 1st, 1803, a confrontation was inevitable. When they met outside that courthouse, they exchanged angry and heated words, and their voices rose in anger as onlookers gathered on to witness the quarrel. And after some of those words exchanged, Sevier apparently challenged Jackson to draw arms, but Jackson was only armed with the cane to Sevier's sword, and so Jackson declined. But during the exchange, Sevier alluded to Jackson's lack of military experience before becoming a major general. And so Jackson's defending his services to the country. And Sevier remarked, quote, services, I know of no great service you rendered the country except taking a trip to Natchez with another man's wife. <laughs> so with that insult, Sevier had crossed a line from which he could not retreat. And if you know anything about the relationship between Andrew Jackson and Rachel, you know you do not insult Rachel without incurring the wrath of Old Hickory. And so Jackson came to the defense of his wife's honor. He said, quote, great God, do you mention her sacred name? Jackson then lunged at Sevier, and allies of both men drew pistols, and actually one pistol was fired and an errant bullet grazed an innocent bystander in the skirmish. But cooler heads prevailed. The men were quickly separated. But this was the begin only the beginning of their confrontation. Thereafter, the two men traded letters with gradually escalating insults. In a letter dated October 2nd, 1803, just a day after the incident, Jackson called Sevier's conduct a, quote, ungentlemanly expression. And he challenged Sevier to a duel. Severe answered Jackson's letter with his a nearly word-for-word -word mocking rebuke. Severe did not want to engage Jackson within the city of Knoxville, or in Tennessee for that matter, because the state law forbade dueling in its borders. Jackson, however, believed that the duel should take place in Knoxville where the insult occurred. So you see a trade of letters between the two men arguing over whether, where they're going to duel. Ultimately, Jackson agreed to meet Severe on his own terms. He said, quote, if it will obviate your squeamish fears, I will set out immediately to the nearest part of the Indian boundary line. You must meet me between this and four o'clock this afternoon, or I will publish you as a coward and a poltroon. So the chaotic events of the day of, of the duel were blurred by loyalties of both parties and they were chronicled by partisan newspapers representing both sides of the dispute. In an affidavit signed by a witness favoring Jackson, it was reported that Sevier had refused to accept a note from Jackson, and soon afterwards, Sevier had retreated behind a tree. News accounts favoring Jackson portrayed Sevier's actions as that of a rogue and a coward, but Sevier's partisans saw no weakness in their governor. The Tennessee Gazette defended Governor Sevier against charges of cowardice in an anonymous editorial written by a citizen of Knox County on November 25th, 1803. And this citizen wrote, quote, strange indeed that after so many battles and engagements, the governor has encountered that such a thing as cowardice should be imputed upon him. Most writers and historians will actually say that and they conclude that this feud between Jackson and Sevier actually marked the beginning of a political divide between East and West Tennessee, which to a large extent still exists today. And long after the feud, Sevier remained bitter over Jackson's insults. 
According to Sevier's own diary, Jackson disturbed his thoughts and haunted his dreams. In his diary, Sevier wrote, quote, Curious dream. I dreamed my father came descending in the air in what appeared at first like a cloud. I asked him if there was any news where he had been. He answered that he had heard much conversation respecting the quarrel between Judge Jackson and myself. He told me that Jackson was viewed by all as a very wicked man and a very improper person as a judge. So despite the feud with Jackson, Sevier's public popularity only momentarily waned. He, he concluded his service as governor, and John Sevier earned the favor of his constituents once more. He served in the Tennessee State Senate, and he later served four terms as a United States Congressman. Now, Al, while in Congress, Sevier died while on, surveying, on a surveying expedition in Creek Territory on September 24, 1815, just a few months following Andrew Jackson's decisive victories in the Creek War and the Battle of New Orleans. He was buried with military honors on a spot of land not far from where he fell ill in Decatur, Alabama. And for over 70 years, there was no statue erected in Sevier's honor and his epitaph was without embellishment. Years later, John Sevier's grandson lamented, quote, that arm that so often drew the sword in defense of his country has long moldered in the soil of a sister state, and Tennessee does not know where the mortal remains of Governor John Sevier lies. The branches of the old hickory cast a long shadow over Sevier's grave, and it was not until the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction that Sevier's remains and his memory were honored in a manner fitting of Tennessee's first hero. In 1889, Sevier's memory was resurrected once more in a grand ceremony that brought thousands of people to the old Knox County Courthouse to witness Sevier's return to native soil. Politicians, historians, Sevier descendants, and other dignitaries gathered in Alabama where his remains were buried for over seven decades. And he was honored with a grand ceremony in Knoxville in a cenotaph worthy of the heroic figure John Sevier's chroniclers sought to recognize as a pioneer, soldier, and statesman. Now I'll wrap up my comments today with a nod to another product of history and memory. In what many here will recognize as the most enduring portrait of Tennessee's first hero. On the right, you see a portrait of John Sevier painted by the well-known portrait artist Charles Wilson Peale. It's on the cover of our book. And when Sevier was a congressman in Philadelphia from 1789 to 1791, he sat for Peale in Peale's effort to chronicle the heroes of the American Revolution through this portrait artistry. Now, if your artist's eye is anything like mine, you'll notice a striking similarity between Sevier and George Washington, the father of our country. This was no accident. Peel had painted George Washington no less than 14 times, and he painted many of the founding fathers of our country. And so Peel's portrait of John Sevier is, it ultimately became the visual memory of Sevier's accomplishments as a pioneer, soldier, and statesman. Now contrast that with the portrait on the left. This is a portrait that depicts the English military leader of the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell. The artist, Sir Peter Lilly, followed the instructions of his subject when Oliver Cromwell told Lilly to paint me as I am, warts and all. Years ago, a former history professor of mine used the Cromwell anecdote in class to tell us how we should study the past with a warts and all approach to the subject. History is not always written in black and white terms. And historical figures like John Sevier were often pragmatic and not as idealistic as their chroniclers would have you believe. When we read of their exploits in the history books, it's important to remember that there are often shades of gray that color the lines between truth and fiction. And how we remember the past is often as important as the past itself. And so history is a complex subject. Don't, when done right, goes well beyond the memorization of names, places, dates, and important events. 
History is full of contradictions. And it's those contradictions that make the study of the past so compelling. This is also what makes John Sevier such a compelling historical figure. Though his chroniclers sought to cast him as an unblemished hero, his flaws, his ambitions, those are what ultimately make him so interesting and compelling. And in my estimation, he is truly warts and all Tennessee's first hero. Thank you. Any questions? So, is he still in Alabama or is he moving? He is in Knoxville. If you will go to the Knox County Courthouse, that monument that I showed in the slide earlier, will, uh, it, that's where he's buried, alongside his wife, Bonnie Kate, who was brought there much later. She lived longer, obviously. And uh, there's also a monument there of uh, his first wife, Sarah Hawkins, who we write about in the book. Her body was never recovered. She died in childbirth, giving birth to her 10th child. And there's a story in the book about how she, um, how she died and how under cover of dark, they brought her body to a spot that some folks had dug a hole for her because they were worried about Indian attacks. So they did this undercover at dark and according to legend and according to the family, Severe actually brought the infant out in the rainstorm to pay respects to his first wife. And it was not much longer after that that he had married Bonnie Kate. So, but the body is in Knoxville. Uh, and it, it, that, that's really one of the stories that kind of inspired me to look a little deeper into Severe's life was why was this man buried in Alabama soil for so long? Why did he only have a charred oak stump and a, a little later on a small headstone to commemorate his deeds? 70 years, no one knew about him. And so I wanted to learn more about that, so. I believe How long was next. he married to Hawkins? Uh, he married Hawkins, I, you know, I forget the year, it's in the book, but she died and uh, he married um, Bonnie Kate really close to the Battle of Kings Mountains, 1779, 78, 79. So they, they were married when, when she was very young, about 15, 16. And so they, he set out to the West. He was a Virginian, native Virginian. And uh, he wanted to uh, acquire land. Much of the land in Virginia had been spoken for. And so he sought adventure out West. And, and he was a very charismatic figure. And so he was able to rally a lot of people behind him. And, and obviously able to charm the ladies. And so he, he uh, charmed Sarah Hawkins and, and then later uh, Bonnie Kate. And an interesting fact about that is they had 18 children all together and all 18 lived to adulthood, which is very mm -hmm. unusual for the time. And that's an interesting fact too because um, these children had children. And so the nation is literally crawling with severe descendants. <laughs> we met over 60 of them. Mm -hmm. we, went to, we went to Marble Springs um, in June. Marble Springs is actually, if you'll hit the next slide, uh, this little cabin that's on the plantation. Marble Springs is um, supposed to be where John Sevier spent his later years in life as governor of Tennessee. And uh, at Marble Springs this past June, we met 66 severe descendants and got to talk to them about the book. And so it was really neat to see those folks. They came as far away as Hawaii. Yeah. So it tells you how far they're 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 literally. Mm -hmm. well, Casey, so, can you talk just a little bit about the monument at the city cemetery? Yes. I mentioned that in the book. That was uh, the monument was erected in, I believe, the 1840s. And it was done by a man named Putnam. And Putnam was uh, someone who greatly admired Severe. He actually married into the Severe family. And uh, he was really distraught over the fact that there was no memorial to Severe and his accomplishments. And so he personally financed that monument and put it in the city cemetery, which caused great confusion among people who naturally thought, well, Severe must be buried there. 
And when they brought his body up from Alabama to Knoxville, you would see in the newspaper accounts some actual confusion about, well, isn't he buried in, in Nashville? Well, no, he's actually still in the ground in Alabama. This was simply a tribute that Putnam had built to Sevier's honor. And so uh, it's something actually I'm, I'm writing about for a forthcoming article in the retrospect about Putnam and his... Uh, this in the cemetery mm -hmm. ran up on that monument mm -hmm. and I thought, think he's buried. No, well, he's not buried. No, I mean, that that's, now, still causes uh, confusion today. What, what about uh, Jackson allies? What did they think about him? Well, you know, Jack, the relationship between the two is interesting because you see letters early on where, you know, they have a little bit of um, friction between them, but then they sort of settle each, settle up, you know, they, they sort of have a, a mutual understanding that, uh, you know, they've got to work together. And so there was a period of time before the incident that I, I talked about where they actually got along. And Sevier is actually writing letters proclaiming how Jackson's this great man and, you know, how we, how, you know, we ought to let him have, uh, you know, this judge. He wanted to appoint him as a judge. And so he wrote a letter of support to Jackson. But then politics get in the way. And so Jackson's a very ambitious man and he wants to move up. And the man standing in his way is obviously John Sevier. John Sevier is very popular in the East. And when John Sevier becomes governor, the majority of the state that's outlined for him to rule is occupied by Native Americans. And so his center of power is in the East where the settlements are. Jackson's moved West to Nashville, Hermitage. And so he's consolidating his political power out in the West, what's considered the West at that time. It's middle now, but so the ambitions sort of cloud the men's judgment a little bit. And, you know, Jackson was really eager to get a position in the military. And so to do that, he had to get past severe and he you know he leveled those charges of bribery and scandal land fraud which you know if you go back and look at the records you can make a case for that if you really want to uh, you can make a case that severe knew nothing about it so it, severe is really kind of careful about his his dealings when another incident that happened during the state of franklin severe uh, engaged in conversations with the spaniards to uh, make sure that the state of Franklin became an independent state. Now, a lot of people would say that's treasonous. Why are you engaged with Spaniards? You need to go through the normal process. Well, there was no normal process. The state of Franklin actually was, gave rise to a constitutional amendment that laid out the process by which we bring states into the union. So, you know, Severe was actually very careful in that. He sent his son out to do exchange the letters and so you don't really see Severe's hand actually mm -hmm. touching a letter but, but, he was but he was arrested for treason against North Carolina he it was viewed that you know creating this state of North Carolina or state of Franklin violated the sovereignty of North Carolina Ken? Quite, I'm just curious um, you know Jackson by 1815 is pretty well known Mm -hmm. So when Severe dies, was there any sort of official or public statement by Jackson, or was it just ignored? Or I'm not aware of one by Jackson, but when Severe died, during uh, when the word got back to the General Assembly, um, Adam Huntsman, who was a senator at the time, he, he issued a resolution that urged all the members of the General Assembly to wear a black armband for 30 days in remembrance of Severe. And so there was this uh, sort of shock and, and uh, effort to remember Severe, but Jackson had become this, not regional, but national figure with uh, the Battle of New Orleans and the Creek War. And so he, his legend as a Tennessee hero eclipsed that of Severe. You can see their career trajectories just sort of intersecting. One's on the rise and one's on the fall. 
And when Jackson becomes this national hero, where Severe was more of a regional figure, you see, uh, you know, Severe's life and legacy suddenly forgotten, which may attest to the fact that he was in Alabama soil for 70 years. No one, we have Jackson to worship now, so. But, what were the difference in ages of the two? Uh, so, I think it's 22. 22, yeah, there were, there were considerable differences. He was, I believe, in his 60s when the duel was taking place, late 50s, early 60s, severe, and then Jackson was in his 30s. So, yes. Was the conflict between um, Jackson and Severe ultimately the thing that dissipated his popular opinion and political rise and the respect amongst the Tennesseans and the Nationals? You mean Severe? Correct. Um, well, I don't know that it happened immediately because what you have going on, you know, Jackson, you could argue without the support of Rachel and her wealthy family, until he wins those battles, you know, he's, he's still very low in the pecking order of, of hierarchy. And so, you know, Severe's still quite popular, but, you know, Severe, after this incident takes place, you know, he, he, he gets a little bit of a negative reaction, but it's not as much as you would think because East Tennesseans really rallied behind him. And, but by the time he leaves the governor's office, he's, he's older and he doesn't do a lot in Congress to really make a name for himself. He's, there's one line in the book where I talk about severe, uh, a reporter is watching him and, and he's, he's viewing him and he, he, he says something to affect He's watching the old general with daggers from his eyes. He's got this, this look of disdain, and he, he aimed that disdain towards uh, the Creek Indians, who he believed were being uh, supported by the British in the run-up to the War of 1812. And so he was a war hawk during his time in Congress. But beyond that issue, Severe was really not very vocal. He sort of stayed in the background. He didn't give rousing speeches. And, and so he almost allowed Jackson to rise up and become this hero without a lot of, of resistance. And you know, part of that's due to, I guess, a declining age. Part of it's due to he didn't have the political skill to form a lasting uh, base of political uh, activity. He, he was more interested in forming friendships and alliances and Jackson was very cunning in his way of, of creating something that would last and of course you had the era of Jacksonian democracy that came up from Jackson's activities and so Severe was probably a victim of his own lack of, of really establishing a legacy beyond you know his early years as an Indian fighter and and this figure of the Revolutionary War he sort of in a sense rested on those that reputation whereas Jackson was building his so um, you know Sevier's reputation didn't suffer a lot I think actually Jackson's reputation suffered more after the duel but only briefly because once he wins those wars that duel is long forgotten so did it did it hurt that jackson eventually became the president and he took his powers to really overshadow anything severe had accomplished oh yes um, obviously you become president of the united states uh you're going to have a, a more uh, a, a visible presence in the mind and the memory of those who are chronicling your history. And so, you know, what I write about in this book is more, as I said, how people recall Sevier's time. And you see, you know, this, these waves of remembrance, you know, after, you know, even during his lifetime, you see Sevier himself remembering his exploits in the King's Mountain and recalling those to his followers after his death 
you see this wave of remembrance, but then it ebbs downward as Jackson's building his life up. And then after the Civil War, people are looking too severe as sort of this unifying force because the South had just been thoroughly defeated. And so they were looking for somebody who had actually won a war and they wanted to rally around a Tennessean and say, oh, here's John Sevier. We need to remember this man. And so you see his waves of remembrance. But Jackson obviously, I mean, he dominates the memory of, of Tennessee history. And Sevier, I mean, the most full-length biography of John Sevier was originally published in 1932 and reissued in the 70s and really hasn't been a full-length biography of Sevier since. And I don't claim this to be a biography, but uh, I structured it in a biographical manner so it would give, I hope, inspiration for people to kind of explore this man's life. So, mm -hmm. yes? Any of the descendants go into politics? Well, uh, of course, George Washington Sevier was very active. Uh, he, he was appointed, I believe, uh, also in the state militia. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks, you know, they sort of rested on Sevier's reputation. And so, yeah, I, I didn't dig too deep into them. But I know, uh, you know, George Washington Sevier is one, one of those men that uh, was often consulted by the men like Lyman Draper, who I mentioned, as sort of um, someone who could, they could go to and recall their life. And so, um, you know, he was, he was active in that sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs>